Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you to Susan Koger, uh, the founder and owner of Mod Cloth, um, along with her husband, Eric. Um, they've really built up a very unique uh, online only retailing business. And I'm sure that you're going to have a lot of questions for her and it's going to be a really engaging um, opportunity for you to learn from such a young entrepreneur who's seen um, lots of success just within the past few years. And so we're going to, um, you know, run this very informally. And if you have questions, well, she's going through, um, you know, her introduction and, uh, you know, review of her business, please just feel free to ask questions. So without further ado, I give you Susan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is this fine? Do I need to be closer or? Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, please feel free to jump in. I mean, I'm going to just keep talking, but if you have questions, like feel free to stop me, raise your hand and we can dive into it because I'm going to kind of be going through like the different parts of our business and kind of, yeah, what's hopefully what sets us apart from the crowd. And um, we'll have time afterwards for Q&A too. So, but please feel free. I'm, I definitely like want the questions while I'm talking. So I'd love to start out, hopefully you guys have seen the site or you ladies. It's one gentleman, right? <laughs> um, hopefully you ladies have seen the site. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about our customers. So she's you know, 15 to 30. It's kind of the age demographic that we think about. Um, independent minded. You know, She really wants to wear something that's unique. She wears a lot of vintage. Vintage is how mod cloth started out. We used to sell just one of a kind vintage pieces. Um, so she's, and it, it definitely, I mean, it can go, it can skew higher than that age range. It can go younger, um, but that's really who we think about when we're, you know, buying and marketing and merchandising to our customer. Um, and we think about kind of the sweet spot as 18 to 24. So headed to college, in college, just out of college, like that age range. Um, so, you know, she's online all the time. She's on Facebook, she's on Twitter. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of you know, who we're talking about. So I'd like to start by telling you about our founding story, kind of how we've gotten to where we are today, um, how ModCloth has grown from a one-woman operation, literally out of my dorm room, to a growing online retailer with, you know, we were kind of like gaining momentum. Um, we employed a few people to one of the best places online to find independent vintage-inspired fashion. Um, to where we are today, which is, you know, this is, um, this logo actually represents the last year or so. We relaunched our site and rebranded um, in July of 2009. And we're now, we have over 100 people on our team. Um, we're based out of Pittsburgh. Um, we're in the process of opening offices in San Francisco and in Los Angeles as well. Um, so it's grown tremendously. When we founded it, it was just my husband and I. And... Um, yeah, we have over 100,000 unique people visiting the website every day, and we're shipping out 1,000 orders a day, around 1,000 orders a day. So it really started all back in 2002. Um, it was the summer between high school and college. Uh, my husband and I, then my boyfriend, Eric, he's our CEO now, um, we both grew up in South Florida. We were actually high school sweethearts, which I know is kind of funny, but um, we were... We actually both got into Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and we were preparing for our first winter ever, and we were just thrifting all the time. I've always loved to thrift. It's something that I used to do with my mom and with my grandma, and it's just love vintage clothing. I love the story behind the clothing. And um, yeah, so we were thrifting all the time. I was buying stuff that didn't even fit me. In South Florida, there's great winter wear, as you can imagine. All the retirees come down and unload, and no one's there to buy the winter wear. So I was like buying stuff, and I'm like, oh, maybe I will use the buttons for something, or I'll give it to a girlfriend, or you know, I'll find some use for it. And um, my boyfriend, husband now, Eric, um, had a background in web hosting. So he was like, you know, you should start a website and sell some of this stuff. I can help you, you know, kind of set up the technical back end. And I really love the idea of kind of sharing my fashion point of view with the world. You know, if I could just have a little tiny voice in the fashion industry, like that was so appealing to me. So that summer we bought the inventory. I, you know, photographed everything, wrote the descriptions, measured everything. Um, it's literally like in my childhood bedroom in my parents' house. 
Um, and we launched, so we got the site set up, we launched in January of 2003, so kind of during our first winter break. And we actually had a sale on our very first day. And I see that really as my kind of birth as an entrepreneur. So for me, it was like having that sale is like, wow, someone will actually buy this. Like someone actually cares about what I'm doing. And so all through 2002 to 2006, I was running the business part time while I was getting my undergraduate degree. I was a business major, actually. Um, I was really interested in fashion, but didn't really know I was like, I'm not really talented enough to be a designer. I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, my parents were kind of like, get a business degree, <laughs> you know, like that's you know marketable. So um, yeah, so I was studying business and kind of working on the business whenever I could. And it was just, it was so much fun. It's kind of like once you are bitten by the entrepreneurial bug, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's really rewarding. And this is actually, this is a picture of our house in Pittsburgh. Um, we were running the business out of the basement. That was our shipping. And, you know, we were kind of like, we were growing kind of between 2002 and 2005. When I came to my senior year, I really had a big decision to make. It was kind of like, what am I going to do when I graduate? We saw that we had traction in the marketplace. We saw that we had a lot of visitors, um, a lot of people coming to the sites. So we had more visitors than we had product. Um, but it was a really difficult business model because it was one of a kind vintage. There's one piece of everything. It's in one size. It's in one color. If it doesn't fit you, you know, it's kind of too bad. So we went to our customers. We actually surveyed them as part of our, one of our marketing courses. So we could kind of like write it off as schoolwork too. And we surveyed our customers and we asked them if the pieces on mod cloth were vintage inspired rather than one of a kind vintage, would you still buy them? And I think we asked, we probably asked like 50 people and 95% of them said yes. So... Oh, sorry. That was the question we were trying to answer. So we um, decided that we were going to try to go for it. We raised some money from our family, um, from two of Eric's uncles, and we actually kind of like Googled, like, where do you buy wholesale clothing? Um, and came up with the Magic Trade Show, which happens twice a year in Vegas. So we kind of took the plunge and went for it. This is a horrible picture, but it kind of shows like this was our first shipment. It was so exciting. It was like, yeah, I, I think we worked with like three or four brands that first year. And um, we went to, yeah, we went to Magic in February of 06. So it was kind of the spring season of 2006. And in 2006, when I graduated, we uh, moved into a bigger basement. So out of that first house that you saw covered in snow. And we were, we bought this house in Pittsburgh and we were literally, it was like the basement was our distribution. The first floor was our kind of conference room, AKA living room. Um, the second floor we had our offices and we actually had two tenants to help pay the rent. And on the third floor we had like our bedroom and our photo studio. And we grew in that house from the summer of 06 all the way up to April of 2008. You can kind of see like how the, uh, the basement was set up. It was actually a little hazardous. We had to like duck to go around and pull orders. So in April 08, we moved out of the house. Finally, it was definitely time. We had like shoe boxes in the garage. It was totally insane. Um, our mailman really hated us because every day they would come and there'd be like a huge pile of packages. Um, and so in June 2008, we raised our first round of institutional capital. Um, with First Round Capital, uh, who is, First Round Capital is started by the entrepreneur who ran Half.com. Uh, his name is Josh Koppelman. He sits on our board now. And um, with an angel investor, Jeff Floor, who he's the former CEO and founder of StubHub, which is a ticket sales. Half.com is books. It's, it was bought by eBay. I guess you can see that up there. Um, and that was a really big step for us. We finally had capital to grow in a big way and to, you know, kind of move out of the house, actually have a, a real office space, um, really hire in a, like seriously in a, in a real way. And it's, it's been really incredible to have advisors, especially, you know, people who are entrepreneurial minded, who have been there before, who can kind of, you know, help us think about these things that we're running into as we grow. Um, in October of 08, we took, we actually, we raised a million dollars on that first round of financing. We took it, we invested it almost entirely into inventory. And in 08, we uh, moved on out. We moved um, our distribution into a, I think it was about 70 or 17,000 square feet uh, space in Ambridge. This is uh, 
aren't the best pictures. We can kind of see we like took a weekend unpacking everything and cleaning everything. And we are now, we moved out of Ambridge. We're in Pittsburgh's um, Strip District. If any of you have been there, you'll know where that is. Um, and this is our distribution. We now have uh, 50,000 square feet. And our office is um, in the same area of Pittsburgh, just about a five minute drive away. And we have, I think we're at 20,000 square feet of office space now. So you can see it's been just kind of a incredible growth in the last few years. So now that you kind of have the story, are there any questions? Yes. Okay, so is how many people do we have working for us? He told me to repeat it for the camera. Sorry. <laughs> um, we have, oh gosh, I think it's 108 right now. Yeah. And that. Yeah, they're, they're full time. So, um, I mean, ModCloth is definitely a very wide organization. We do our own distribution. So of that 108, I think it's like 40 of them are in the distribution center. So that's, you know, doing the intake, the QA, shipping the actual products to the customer. Um, you know, we have a big customer care team. We have photography, design, uh, buying teams, merchandising, HR, finance. It's kind of, you know, across the board. We do everything in-house. Our web design is in-house as well. Um, it's kind of, so we've sort of always approached, even when we were doing one of a kind vintage, kind of approached it as a lifestyle. So just thinking like, you know, we know who our customer is, what will she want to buy? What will she find really unique and what can you not find anywhere else? And so we have, we've been focusing in the last year more so on the home decor section. Um, but it's been, it's been something that we have had in a small way. It's, it's something that we're developing more into part of the lifestyle. Previously, it was more of a gift section. So we had it there for holiday. You know, you can come and buy part of the brand, but you don't have to worry about the fit and you don't have to. It's easier to buy someone a houseware than like clothing and jewelry is very personal, you know. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's definitely something that we're focusing more on and growing, but it has always been a part of the merchandising mix. is when did we turn our first profit? Um, yeah, absolutely. So we were profitable last year on the year. Um, I mean, it was, it was pretty marginal, but to be profitable at this stage with how fast we're growing, we were very happy with that. I'm not, honestly, I don't know exactly when it was. I'm not, my, my husband, our CEO, is kind of the guy who's like on the numbers and can tell you our, our revenue for every single month dating back three years. Um, but we were, I can say that, yeah, 09 was profitable in the black. That's probably right. Yeah, I mean, it, absolutely. It, when I think back to the time when I was doing it, you know, it was just me. Um, and I was kind of like, oh, I'm going to get some extra spending money for college. But I'm sure if you looked at all the hours I spent and looked at the money that we actually made. I mean, we weren't investing much in inventory at that point because it was thrift store finds. But yeah, I'm sure I was making like $1.50 an hour or something like that. But it was so much fun that I loved doing it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's what I love. It's my passion. It's, um, it's the, I'll, I'll say it's the only work I've found that doesn't feel like work. So I can go to a trade show, you know, buy the entire day, and by the end of it, I still love it. And I don't, I guess, uh, yeah, you, I, I still want to go back out the next day. I don't, like, wake up and look at my closet and be like, oh, I can't look at another dress. <laughs> Every now, there's certain dresses that I don't want to see another one of again. Like, yeah, I won't go into that, but <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Okay, so moving forward, um, I wanted to talk about kind of the three areas of the organization that I deal with. Um, I guess I can kind of talk about what my role is at ModCloth. So my official title is Chief Creative Officer. Um, basically, that means that I act as kind of the final brand checkpoint across the buying, merchandising, design, photography, writing, um, all the creative teams in the business. I also function as the head buyer, so that's why I'm here in New York right now. I'm at the, go, we're going to the Fame trade show. Um, so I'm part of the buying process. Almost 
everything you see on the site I've been part of and physically, you know, pick that product. Like, yes, this is a product that we want to sell. Um, I do have a team. I have a great team and they do great work, but it's something that I really feel passionately about and that I love doing. So yeah, so starting with buying, I can kind of talk about how we think about our buying organization. Um, so we kind of split it into two tracks. There's scouting, which is basically like your trend research, um, brand and designer discovery, which we're always doing. We're going to trade shows. We're looking on Etsy. We're looking online. Uh, we have a lot of designers send us line sheets. So we're like constantly you know, going through the email queue and looking at what's new. Um, and this is kind of the side that I head up. I'll say, you know, from a trend forecasting, um, you know, planning point of view, I very much, I've taken the approach, I'm, I'm definitely very self-taught, and I've taken the approach to kind of buy what I personally am reacting to. You know, I'm very much part of the demographic and psychographic of our customer. So a lot of it is just, you know, is this something that I find new and exciting? Is this something that I'm going to want to wear? And of course, you know, I've also built the intuition over the years of, seeing, you know, the, these are good styles, these are certain cuts or certain bodies that photograph well, these are certain colors that do well online versus others. Um, and there's definitely, buying for the internet is freeing and limiting. It's freeing in a way that I don't have to worry about. If I had a boutique in Pittsburgh, I'd have to worry about the weather, I'd have to worry about the, you know, are people adventurous in Pittsburgh? Maybe their personal style isn't so great, maybe they can't wear suede shoes because they're gonna ruin them because it rains a lot. Um, buying for the internet, I'm able to kind of, you know, I'm not limited by the seasons. You know, we have customers in Australia and they're in winter right now. So we're able to, yeah, we're, we're able to think it's freeing in that way. It can be limiting in that, you know, you don't, you don't get to touch the garment. So it needs to, it needs to look great on a form. Um, so there are certain cuts that just don't make sense. They're harder to think about, you know, exactly how would I wear this, where if you were able to interact with the garment in a store, you'd be able to get a better feel for it. So in any case, is there anything that I can, any questions I can answer about that side of the buying process, kind of choosing the product and trend spotting? Okay. So we also have a purchasing track and we think about this is like the planners. These are the people that are looking at the analytics. They're doing the vendor relations, so they are, you know, we're, the scouting team is like, these are the products we want. The purchasing team is following up and saying, okay, what's the price point on this? Like trying to negotiate the quantity, the ship date, um, making sure everything is in line and reordering, which is a huge portion of our business. So I can kind of talk a little bit about the designers that we work with. Um, we think about it as this kind of pyramid. So on the top, we have the mainstream designers. These are people that you'll see at a place like Nordstrom. They're picked up by Urban sometimes. Um, and when we deal with the mainstream, we're very particular about you know, choosing pieces that aren't going to be, you know, if it's, if it's a piece that's all over Macy's, we don't want it at Mod Cloth because it's not, it's not that unique you know, if you can go into any mall in the US and find it. Um, we think about small business owners. So when I talk about them, these are people, a lot of them are based in LA. They're doing production. Um, some of them are doing, some of them are importing. A lot of them are producing domestically. And then we think about uh, DIY designers, and that's a lot of, we've worked with some of them. There's a ton of them on Etsy and kind of all over the place. And, you know, a lot of them here. So we, we've been focusing on this kind of small business owner tier. So these are designers that generally work with small brick and mortar boutiques. They usually sell, you know, six to 36 pieces at a time. And we were really one of the first websites to bring them to the web to bring their products uh, to the internet. And I can talk really quickly, and if this is like stuff that you guys already know, feel free to chime in. But um, we talk a little bit about how they run their business. So they're you know, sketching a design, they're sourcing the materials to, cr enough materials to create a sample of the design, putting it in front of buyers like myself and other brick and mortar boutique owners at trade shows or in their showroom. Um, once they gain enough non-committal POs, they'll go ahead and produce the garment or they'll buy the bulk materials and then produce the garment. Um, usually, yeah, they're contracting to manufacture, they're not vertical. Um, and then they're distributing it to the boutiques and to retailers like us and hopefully the customers buy the product at the end of all that. So right now we're buying between 36 to 72 units of a style. Um, usually for them, their minimum production is like 100 to 300. It depends on the type of item and how complex it is. 
Um, and we're, we run into a problem where like a third of the items that we like never get made. So a lot of times we're picking the more fashion forward, maybe a little bit of more weirder pieces. So we'll go and we'll see it at a trade show and then we'll find out a month later, oh, we didn't get enough POs for that, that item, it's not gonna be made. So we can drive the production if we feel really strongly about, but that opens us up to a lot of inventory risks. So we generally don't. Yeah, when items hit, so we'll bring in the 36. When it hits, we can reorder enough to drive another cut of the unit if they're able to, if there's enough fabric and if they have the capacity. So we've been, our inventory strategy and how we've been able to grow so quickly and we turn our inventory over six times a year. So it's very, very fast. Um, we start out with a very small buy. And so we're, we're buying to kind of, not to say that it's gonna be like a total, like it's gonna be dead stock, it's gonna be a total dog, it's not gonna move at all, but we buy to the small demand curve. So we say, okay, if this is just an a below average product, we're gonna clear it out in 60 days. And then this is, I mean, this is definitely a very simplified view of the world, assuming there are three different types of products, all, uh, um, you know, they're all across the spectrum. But yeah, so that's, that's been kind of our strategy here. And then once products hit, once we get a reaction online, we go deep on the reors. So we're really missing a huge opportunity on the big hits, especially. Basically, we'll reorder, we'll order you know, 60 to start, they'll sell it in a day. We'll reorder 300, that will come in like four weeks later and that will sell out in a week. And then we'll realize that we should have ordered 6,000 at the beginning. So we launched Be the Buyer in November, if you've seen it on the site. Basically, we work with our designers to take these products that wouldn't have been made otherwise. We take a photograph of the sample and we put it on our website. Um, we allow our customers to either vote to bring it into the inventory or to skip it, and we allow them to leave comments. So we'll see everything from, you know, I wish this dress was lined, or it should have pockets, or the pockets suck. I mean, if you take a look at, it's, this is live on the site, you can take a look and look through the comments. It's really interesting to see um, what people think. And then we have the social component as well. So you can share the product on Facebook, share it on Twitter, encourage your friends to vote, because if it gets enough votes, it'll actually be made. So this is something that's been, it's still fairly new. Like I said, we just launched it in November, but it's been a great program for us. And this is a big part of the vision of ModCloth is really democratizing the fashion process, really giving our customers more of a voice. They're the ones that are going to be wearing the product, so they should have a say in what's going to be made or not. I mean, I'm, you know, I think of myself, hopefully I'm a good buyer, but, you know, I have a limited point of view, right? Like I'm buying, you know, maybe I have a certain body shape and so I lean towards, you know, A-line dresses because that's what, that's what works really well on me. So I think, okay, that's what I'll bring into the store but allowing our buyers to, or <laughs> allowing our customers to be the buyer and actually be part of the retail experience is really exciting. And I mean, I'll say, you know, this fashion is an industry that's kind of hard to get into, you know, there's only, it's something that can be really intimidating. It's like this top down kind of industry where there's these people at the top that say, this is what you should wear. And it kind of filters down. And we really feel strongly about giving the customers a voice and allowing them to yeah, be part of the, of the retail, of the online shopping experience. And the internet is really enabling that. I mean, we're seeing it already. Bloggers are being invited to fashion shows and sitting on the front row. Like, it's, it's already happening, and, but you're not really seeing it happen in retail. So we want to be the first to pioneer that. Um, okay, so moving back into the presentation. Um, so Be The Buyer allows us to kind of insert these steps along the way of the, of the process. So basically we're kind of de-risking the, the designer's value chain. And so we see as we develop this supply chain expertise, as we're producing bigger and bigger runs, we can actually work with the smaller independent uh, DIY designers and bring their products to market for the first time. So we're able to talk to someone who maybe is selling one-offs on Etsy and say to them, you know, we can take a sample of this, put it in our Be The Buyer program if the customers like it. Um, you know, you'll see what kind of demand there is in the market. Like we could go back to them and say, you know, we can produce 6,000 of these. Do you want to produce it? Can we help you find, you know, can we help you find domestic production to do this at this type of price point um, and really open up this market? There's, it's like, as you can see, it's the biggest part of the pyramid. There are tons of these 
there are tons of design ideas out there. Um, it's just, you know, actually executing it and being able to produce the products in an efficient, um, you know, ethical, price point sensitive way. Um, we also have this concept to allow our customers to kind of be the designers. So you can see here, these dresses all look pretty similar. They're like a two for body. Um, so we have this, you know, kind of concept, and this is something that doesn't exist on the site today, but we see, you know, moving into it in the future of allowing, of going out into the marketplace, sourcing fabric, sourcing different trims, and allowing our customer to, through an online sort of interface, kind of iterate on different designs. So plaid bottom, solid top with a button here, that sort of thing. Okay, any questions, any, uh, anything? Yeah, so the, the idea would be to feed um, the be the designer kind of, it'd be like a, and this is something that we haven't done yet. This is like, you know, we'd love to do it. But um, yeah, it'd be an online interface where you kind of are creating a CAD and then the best, the ones that are voted as the best, actually we go into develop a sample of the product, put that through be the buyer and then see what the actual marketplace demand is for it. And then we would produce the item. And whoever designed it would get, you know, commission or be some sort of, you know, we haven't really thought through probably like a threadless model where you get commission on each. I'm not sure. I think they do a lump sum if your design gets chosen or if it's commission on each item. I don't know. But something like that. So would it be considered like a private label, like a hot cloth? Yeah. And as of right now, you don't have any private label at So we do... So Moncloth is definitely very much about the mix of products more so than specific products. We do exclusives with designers, but we don't produce, we don't go to production ourselves. So we contract with them to make, yeah, items that are exclusive to us that will only be sold through Modcloth, but we don't have a Modcloth house brand. Um, we keep it under that designer's brand. How many kids are you using each day? I mean, what It's um so we we have over a hundred thousand unique visits per day, and we're doing I think it's it's I mean depending on the day, I think it's between eight hundred and eleven hundred orders per day. And there's to give you an idea of how many items there's I think the average is two point five items per order. I'm sorry I didn't repeat any of those questions. Is that okay? <laughs> it's it's kind of awkward. Now I'm talking to the camera, which is more awkward. <laughs> I think, do you have a question? I think I answered. Oh, okay, cool. Anything else? How often do you um, receive buys for online sales? So we are constantly buying. Um, that was one thing that I actually didn't cover, so I'm glad you asked. Um, we are, I had it in my notes and just totally forgot. Um, we buy kind of all year round. We're, we buy immediates up to in some cases, nine months out. It just depends on the designer that we're working with and what their schedule's like. But um, yeah, we're, we're constantly updating. Um, in the merchandising section, I'll go into, you know, we launch between 10 and 50 new items a day. So the site is, and that's definitely part of our, you know, it's very intentional. It's, we want our customers to be coming every day to see what's new. And um, does that answer your question? Is there anything? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By, by a what? I'm sorry. Oh, so sort of what do we do with dead stock, like clearance? So we do, um, so we, we definitely, you know, from a kind of branding point of view, we definitely aren't a clearance brand. So we try to be very careful about not messaging sales all the time. Um, and you know, there's, we're not. I'd say we're we're like we're a good value. We're not we're not Forever Twenty One. We're not Anthropology. We're kind of you know in the middle there. But we're definitely not clearance. Um, and because of from our inventory strategy that I kind of talked about earlier, we're kind of always buying to the smaller demand curve, assuming that the product will be average below average. 
Um, so we're usually able to move our initial order of, of product within 60 days, which is fine for us. We don't discount um, products that that stay around too long. You know, we made a bad bet or maybe we reordered like we ordered 60. They sold it really well. We reordered it. And by the time it came back, our customer just wasn't as interested in it. Um, we do we have promotions like. We have one called 12 Z's Tuesdays, where we do 12 items at 12% off every Tuesday. And they're kind of merchandised into a little group. So it'll be nautical themed or you know, pretty florals or something like that. So we, have, we try to do ways where it seems like, it's like a merchandise promotion more so than a sale or a clearance. Um, and then we do two big clearances every year. So it's generally in January and August or September. And we'll do you know, 70% off, all these items, no returns. And that's, we, because we are, because we're not a clearance brand and because we do sales very, very sparingly, those items just fly out the door. So the last time we did it, we, I think we put our, it was like our bottom 400 SKUs um, and we did them 70% off and they moved in like, it was like 30 hours and they were gone. Like it was just crazy, so. It's definitely, you know, it's something that we think a lot about. Um, it's, yeah, we, we're always, so we have um, product reviews on the site and we're working on getting those built into our buying analytics. Um, right now, as buyers, we look over the reviews, but we don't really have a great scorecard of, you know, this vendor consistently gets bad reviews, this type of cut consistently gets bad reviews, that sort of thing. Um, but we're, yeah, I mean, we're definitely, keeping it in mind, you know, there's nothing, Montcloth is all about customer lifetime value. So it's like, if there's a crappy product that might photograph well and we'll be able to send it to her, but she's gonna take it out and be really disappointed and feel like she overpaid, you know, she's not gonna come back. And we're, you know, even though we made that one sale, you know, we're really thinking about, you know, we want her to come back, we want her to order with us, you know, 14 times in the next two years. Um, so that's, it's definitely something that we consider, I think, as far as where the product is made, um, yeah, I mean, if we have a product that's produced domestically or produced, you know, if, if it's organic cotton or it's produced in, you know, a special way, we definitely talk about that. I'm not sure, for our customer, she is, she's not super price sensitive, but she's also not willing to spend, you know, kind of double the price for an organic dress that looks the same as a non-organic dress, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that we think about and it's something that as we move forward and we have better analytics, we're definitely, it's going to be a bigger part of the buying process and the buying decision making. Yeah, I mean, we want her to just be blown away. We wanted to try it on and feel like it was 10 times better than it looked online. And I feel like I got, you know, it was worth the price and I'm going to, next time I shop at Mod Cloth, rather than just buying the one thing, I'm going to buy four because I trust it. Right. Yeah, so I mean, as a retailer, that can be a big challenge because we carry, I mean, we have over a thousand active vendors in our system. Um, we're not, we don't always carry products from all thousand of them. But yeah, it's, it's, it is a pretty wide variance. So we do a few things. Um, we measure each size and we do that flat across the garment. Um, and that's, we found that that's the best way to. You can measure the dress and then we encourage our customers to measure a similar cut, similar style dress flat across and com contrast and compare. Um, user reviews helps a lot for that. So people are, people, we encourage our customers to come back and to leave a review about the product. So to say, you know, I'm, and a lot of them do have to have a lot to do with size. So they'll say, you know, I'm five foot nine, I weigh, you know, 140 pounds and this fit me in this way. Um, we also, I think a lot of it is, again, thinking about lifetime value, really thinking about customer service. We have a great team on the ground in Pittsburgh that's available to chat um, for, I think it's like 10 hours out of the business day. They're available via phone. And we have, um, we call them the mod stylists. So you can chat with them and ask them, 
about fit questions. You can ask them even about like, I'm going to a wedding, what kind of dress would you recommend or what shoes would you recommend with this dress? And you know, we provide all of these on the product page itself. You have all these links to be able to reach out and talk to us directly. Um, and kind of in the future, we see, we definitely see user reviews. We see um, allowing customers to see reviews from similar customers. So once we're able to gather more information about our customer and once we have the kind of techn technological capability, um, allow customers to enter their measurements while they're creating an account if they choose to. And then you can see reviews from people that are the same height or people that you know, are the same, have a similar body type or have, a same, have the same size. And we see that as, um, you know, that's really how you can do it. Because we get, we'll get a lot of comments where it's like, I wish you would photograph your clothing on models or on tall models or short models or curvier models. And, you know, allowing, we just need to allow our customers to talk to each other. They're willing to do it. Uh, so that's kind of what, where we're moving. Um, so reviews are moderated. Reviews, every review is approved by a person. Um, and with the reviews, we, so I, w I would say we moderate links to competitors. We moderate um, any sort of curse words or racial profanity, like racial slurs or anything like that. Um, yeah, otherwise, I mean, if it's, a if it's a really bad review, we let it go live. I mean, it's like, okay, we just made a mistake there and maybe that's an item that we end up clearancing out. Um, you know, it's important. It's a, a return costs us because we have free returns. A return costs us a lot of money. So, you know, in the time and in the, the shipping back to us and the packaging and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we would rather that customers know, you know, if someone's like this dress did not work for my body type, looks horrible on, I look pregnant, you know, we'd rather that that's public um, so that, you know, we'll avoid the returns and so that our customers will have a great, going back to lifetime experience, so our customers will have a great experience. Um, so we have in the Be the Buyer program, we have comments and those actually aren't moderated. So anything that's comment, anything that's posted goes live and um, probably at some point in the future, we'll have comments on the products, on all products. And uh, I mean, we still go back and you can report it is inappropriate. So our customers kind of self moderate and will let us know if there's anything that's just really, you know, out there. Anything else? Cool. Okay, so moving into merchandising. Uh, merchandising, I'm being very specific about how we present the product on the website. So a big part of what makes Mod Cloth unique is our unique names and descriptions of the products. We have a great fashion writing team. I think we have 14 people on the team now in Pittsburgh and uh, most of them are women. There's one man. <laughs> These ladies are incredible writers. Um, they, the names and descriptions really give each product character. They help to kind of tell a story, create a cohesive collection among the products because we are carrying products from so many different designers in one place. And it makes each product Googleable, so you're able to, the product at ModCloth is unique to ModCloth. And this is something that we've also had our customers help us out with. No, that looks weird. Um, so we've run this contest on our blog, we call the Name It and Win It contest, and we've done it, I wanna say four or five times now, where basically we take a photo of an item and allow customers to submit comments for the name. And as you see here, we've had over 3,000 suggested names per product when we've done this. And we've definitely seen that the sales curve for these products is lifted. Um, because when our customers are naming the product, she's kind of thinking about what it'll be like in her wardrobe and you know, kind of imagining herself in the product. So it's even if she doesn't win the product and actually be able to name it, she comes back and will buy it. So this is something that we see becoming part of the actual um, shopping experience. So internally, we're calling it Be the Writer. So this is something where every day you can come to ModCloth and one of our new items needs a name. You can suggest names and then we'll, we'll probably choose like the top 10 and turn that back out to the customer ba base to vote for the best one. And we see this as a program that has a really high viral potential. So you can, you know, if your name made it, you can like ask your friends to come vote for you. We can create Facebook widgets and apps and stuff like that. Facebook apps and widgets to put on your blog and that sort of thing. 
Um, a big part of our merchandising is that we have new items all the time. Like I said earlier, we launch between 10 to 50 new items every day. And we time the launch of the new products throughout the day. Um, we've sort of modeled it after popular bloggers. So if you look at like Perez Hilton, he's posting like every 20 minutes throughout the day, kind of like throughout the working day. So we definitely, you know, we've done this very purposefully. We're definitely thinking about, you know, if you're at work or if you're at class, your school, you can bring up the website and kind of like hit refresh and see what's new right then. Yeah, we kind of talked about this already. So mod cloth is definitely about the width of selection. Um, the fact that you can buy a complete outfit, we think really sets us apart from the flash sale sites like Gilt and Rulala and you know, a million others that have popped up since they've done, started to do really well. Um, and we do see that. I mean, our average order is 2.5 items. Um, we do see these orders where she's buying the complete look to wear next Saturday night or to wear to an event. And we see getting our customers involved in this as well. Um, so this is just a mock-up. It's actually kind of a bad one, but you get the idea. Um, so we see a kind of like Polyvore-esque. Does everyone know what Polyvore is? I'm assuming, yeah. So it's like a Polyvore-esque experience in the shopping. Like rather than having a shopping bag, you have a mood board and you can kind of create outfits, save them, put them out in the community. The best ones that are voted up are, you know, maybe we shoot them on our model and use them on our homepage. It's part of our merchandising, part of our marketing. And we really see this as a great way to um, really drill into product recommendations. If you think about uh, e-commerce is all about it was kind of built around books and electronics, these sort of commodity goods that are really easy to sell together. So you say, you know, if you bought this camera, you're gonna like, you're gonna need this battery, you're gonna need this camera case, you know. There's, there's definitely, and for someone, if you're looking for like, uh, you know, I wanna spend 200 to $300, I want it to have video capability, there's a way to find like your perfect camera but there's no perfect dress. You know, if you find three dresses that you like, you're gonna buy all three of them. So we're thinking about this Be The Stylist program um, to really allow us to do product recommendations. So check out this item that goes with this. Um, also to think about, if you think about our customers kind of all over the world, someone living here in March who's maybe 30 is gonna wear and style a dress completely differently than someone who's 15 living in Los Angeles in March. You know, so there's really no way for us to, you know, we can show our customers our point of view, but we really want to get them involved and see, you know, they're great. You see it on Polyvore, like there are people just making these incredible sets every single day. So we really see that as a big part of the shopping experience. So this is something that isn't live. It's, you know, in progress, hopefully will be live this year. It's, um, the tech piece is actually pretty big for this, especially the analytics behind it. Any questions? Comments? Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So um, yeah, there's always a lot of out of stock products and, um, that it's absolutely, if it says it's out of stock, it's gone. It's definitely not marketing. Um, that comes from our sort of inventory strategy of buying to that small demand curve, uh, because we have such a wide breadth of products, you know, for us, we can buy a dress that, yeah, we sell 36 of, and we can, we have certain pieces that we sell thousands of. So... Yeah, it's, um, it's because of that limited inventory strategy. Our first buy is always smaller, and then we see how it reacts and place the reorder accordingly. Um, as soon as, so once it's marked as out of stock, our purchasing team, you know, well, before it's marked as out of stock, once we see that the sales curve is picking up and it's going to sell out, the purchasing team calls the, the vendor to place a reorder. Um, if that reorder comes through, we leave the product live on the site, and we have a kind of notify me on restock. We can, yeah put your email address in and we email you as soon as the product comes in. Um, if it's not going to come in, we turn it off the site. So it's still accessible via Google. If you search for the direct product name, the URL of the product is still live, but you won't see it in the category pages. Yeah, so it just, 
it depends on, yeah, does, is the fabric still there? Maybe they cut more or, you know, maybe some boutiques said they were going to buy 50 of them, but they didn't and were able to buy the extra stock. But we always try to restock if it's a good seller. Yeah. Okay. So moving into marketing, um, this is kind of, Mod Cloth is the fashion company you're friends with. This is like our internal credo, I guess. Um, it's something that I think about all the time when I'm working with our creative team, and I really encourage them to think about that too. Um, Mod Cloth, I, we have, I think it's 108 people on staff right now, and close to 70% of them are women who are in our demographic and psychographic. So we have a huge customer base in the office, um, people all across the organization from buying to customer care to fulfillment to um, you know design and photography. And so we're constantly kind of thinking like, you know, what would, what would you want to see? What do you want from your internet retailer? Um, so big thing that we, Pick a big kind of piece of our marketing is the Mod Life blog. Um, this is something that we've had kind of forever. I want to say since 2005, and I used to write it, and it wasn't very good, honestly. <laughs> We'd have posts like once a week, and we now post every day. Um, we want it to be a destination piece. Um, this is kind of, this is like, this um, quote right here is from our internal documents. So. Our goal is to create a fun, interactive, aspirational, empowering community for our readers. Um, a big part of this is, yeah, through s posting style icons. So these are, you know, sometimes we do celebrities or, you know, kind of more traditional style icons, but a lot of times we'll find people on Flickr or on Chictopia or customers that we've seen on the streets. Um, and, you know, posting like, isn't this a cool way to merchandise or to, to style this type of product? Um, we talk a lot about trends, new media, um, cooking tips, like DIY tips. Um, we have a post of, it's like, it's, <laughs> we have this ongoing post that's like sexist ads where we post like old vintage ads and talk about why they're really degrading to women. And that's always interesting. And, you know, sometimes we'll talk about the fashion industry itself. So we had a really interesting series of articles on our blog where we talked about you know, we kind of address the plus size issue. Um, we haven't been able to carry very many extended sizes on mod cloth, and a big part of that is that our designers simply aren't making them. We've had a lot of customers like, why aren't you carrying bigger sizes? I mean, a junior's large, and most of the designers that we work with run in junior sizing. A junior's large isn't very big sometimes. So that was something that we talked about and kind of said, you know, we're working in this industry, we're a retailer, you know, we want the designers to create more, but they, you know, sometimes they won't and, you know, just kind of saying, hey, this is our point of view. This is like what we're doing and this is why we're doing it and just, you know, see what our customers have to say. And that was, I think we had like 80 comments on that blog post. It was really great. And we do some behind the scenes at Mod Cloth. So it's like, you know, we're, yeah, like I said, we're customers in the demographic and psychographic. These are things that we do and, you know, kind of what it's like to go to a photo shoot or what it's like to... Oh gosh, I don't know. We've done a ton of behind the scenes stuff kind of across the board. And a lot of that is about, it's, it's about forming like a genuine personal connection. And that's something that's really important and it's something that we see, you know, we see as our biggest competitive advantage versus kind of the big guys. So if you think about someone like American Apparel or Urban Outfitters or other places where our girl might spend her money, um, you know, we think that we can have a more genuine um, upfront conversation with her. And yeah, of course we use the blog to talk about our contests and as with the name and weight contest, we'll actually run the contest on the blog itself and we talk about promotions. So we're doing, you know, we, we kind of like, we try to do a contest like, I'd say it's probably like once a month or so where whether it's through the blog or through, you know, submit a photo of you. We did like a vintage prom one, you know, kind of all across the board. Um, we also use our blog to reach out to other fashion bloggers. So we've had a really successful program that we've called Blogger of the Moment, where, where we will reach out to our favorite bloggers. We'll do an interview with them. Um, we will actually name an item after them and send them the item so they photograph themselves in it. 
And this has been really great because it allows us to highlight people that we really like and that we're really, you know, fans of. I read, gosh, probably like 90 fashion blogs on my Google Reader that I try, you know, I can't say I read them all, but I skim them all. And, um, you know, it's something that's really important. It's a huge source of inspiration for us internally. And this is also great because when we name them Blogger of the Moment, we'll, make, we'll give them a little badge that they then put on their sidebar so they're linking back to Mod Life. And uh, this is another kind of example of a blogger promotion that we did. We found four of our favorite bloggers and sent them each. Um, I think we did it for four weeks. And each week they had a new item to style and we kind of pitted them against each other and had our readers vote for the best one. So this is great because the bloggers promote it on their blog and ask their readers to come vote for them and to check out the post. And we also do social media outreach. So this is a big, it's a really big thing for us. And I think it's something that we do really well. It's something that we've been doing where you're seeing a lot of bigger brands now kind of step onto Twitter, step onto Facebook. It's something that we've just been doing because it just made sense. We're like, our customers are there. We need to talk to them there. So we do Facebook, Twitter, um, kind of all the big ones that you'd imagine. And then we also try to, we're kind of constantly looking for new social networks and very specific niche networks. So Goodreads is a good example. Um, we started a program where we're doing a, we're doing a book review every month and we're, we started a, I want to say like it's a club on book, on Goodreads. I'm actually not a member. Is anyone a Goodreads member? It's a, it's a social network for book lovers and you can like have your bookshelf and you say the books that you've read and the books you want to read and you can like talk to your friends about it. It's cool. But yeah, it's like, it's going, you wouldn't expect to see a fashion company there, but internally we were like, hey, some of us use Goodreads. We think it's cool. Um, you know, our girl is smart and a lot of them are in college or are college educated, so it makes sense. Okay, um, so going into kind of, I prepared a little bit about our two big ones, which are Facebook and Twitter, going to talk about those, the types of conversations that happen there and how we talk to our customers. Um, are there any questions about, no, okay, yeah? <laughs> I think it's definitely long lasting for sure. I think it's um it's a great way to be to have a voice and be part of an industry. Um and yeah, I think it's absolutely going to continue. I mean, where it kind of what the future is, where it ends up, um you know, as far as the bloggers that have kind of become like mini celebrities in their own right. You know, I'm not sure exactly like where that goes down the road if we just see more and more of them or if there'll always be kind of like a blogger of the week type thing happening. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it's ongoing. What do you guys think? Does anyone have any opinions on bloggers? A different opinion? <laughs> cool. Yeah, definitely. Anyone else? Who reads blogs, like fashion blogs, out of everyone here? It's okay. It's like a third, maybe. Cool. Anything else? For me, personally? Ooh. Um, so I'm definitely, I mean, I'm very inspired by personal style. So I really love um, a lot of blogs that are just like one girl kind of doing her thing. And I'm definitely partial to bloggers that are also mod cloth customers because I love seeing mod cloth items on different types of people. Um, I really love, let me see here, Cali Vintage. Um, it's calivintage.blogspot. And uh, she's, uh, she's just, she's very cute. She has a really interesting sense of style. Um, oh, man, top 10. That's really hard. I feel like depending on the post, you know, there's someone that I totally fall in love with. And then I, you know, the next day I'm like, oh, I like this girl better. <laughs> but um, yeah, I definitely love personal style. Kind of this is what I'm wearing in my day to day life. And these are the things that I did. And these are the collections that I'm loving right now and that sort of thing. Okay, so I can talk a little bit about Facebook. Um, 
Because there's definitely, so I talked about the different types of social networks that we're on, and there's definitely a different type of conversation, a different way of speaking to the customer on each social network. And I mean, you guys know this, like I'm sure most of you use social networks, use probably some of like more than one of the ones that I listed. And you don't use them for the same thing. Like some you talk to friends, some you just broadcast out, some you don't actually participate at all, but you're just a viewer. Um, so it's really important to understand those differences and to approach it from that point of view. If you, I think from a corporate perspective, if you as a corporation just kind of send the same promotion or the same blast to all your social networks, it's just not really gonna be that effective. Um, so Facebook, we see a lot of style questions and advice. So kind of like um, our customers will come on and say, I just bought this dress. What should I wear it with? Um, we pose questions where we have our mod stylists create polyvore boards and they kind of, they'll do like one styling on this side and a different one on this side and ask our Facebook fans, which one do you think is better and why? Um, so we have some general customer service on Facebook as well. So like, I can't get your website to load rather than sending us an email. They find it easier to come on Facebook and say, because they're already on Facebook and say, like, I just tried to shop. What the hell is going on? Um, so we facilitate the conversation. But on Facebook, we see a lot of customers talking to each other. So I kind of just like clipped this from our mod class page. You can see that someone asked a question about yeah, like how can I figure out New Zealand sizing? And a customer actually answered before we did, which is really cool. I mean, as long as they're actually answering in the correct way, which she totally did. Um, so that's definitely really useful. And yeah, on Facebook, we have a very active community. It's like 47,000 fans and growing. And Twitter is definitely, compared to Facebook, it's kind of a different animal. We do um, an ongoing contest on Twitter. So we do it every Thursday. I want to say it's like at 4 p.m. on Thursdays. Um, what we call I Spy. We've been doing it for over a year now. It's been very popular. Where we take a macro photo of a product and then our customers tweet us back and say which product it is. So this was one from two weeks ago. And I have no idea, honestly, <laughs> even as the head buyer and uh, Chief Creative Officer, I have no idea what that product is. It's amazing. So our, <laughs> we see people who like, they'll tweet out that they're like studying the site to see, to like learn all the product photos to see um, which product it's gonna be. Um, so that's a big part of our Twitter strategy is having this contest that people can participate in. And um, we also post like links to, I mean, it's really, Twitter's all about like these short little things that you can kind of see and move on. It's like a little break from your day. So we post a lot of interesting finds. So like the latest like cute video that's circulating the internet or you know, this artist just did a really cool project or something like that. Um, what's that? Oh, mod cloth happening. So we'll post like, you know, um, we have a sale going on or did you know that returns are free? Like things like that just to kind of remind our customers like, hey, now might be a good time to go place a mod cloth order should you want to. And then we also have a separate mod cloth for select Twitter stream because we realized that customers wanted to know exactly when new products were launching. So if you follow, you can choose to follow mod cloth first look and we tweet out a link to the product and the name of the product. And Twitter, it's really important to not kind of overload your feed. Um, if you have users that are following you that don't follow that many other people, they're gonna get really sick of you if you're tweeting like 20 times a day. So it's definitely something that we're very conscious of and we're kind of always thinking about whether we should have more offshoot accounts. So, you know, if we're getting, a, like maybe we need one that's just mod cloth happenings if that's getting to be too much. So that's something that we're kind of always, yeah, it's, it's kind of always in the forefront when you're thinking about these social media things is you wanna be relevant, um, you don't wanna overload them and just make it too much noise. I mean, we're just, we're bombarded, you know? If you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, it's just like, you get so much stuff that it's like, like if I get another notification about Farmville or Zombie Land, like I'm like so sick of them and we don't ever want people to be like, wow, I'm so sick of mod cloth. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. I mean, not to say anything bad about Farmville, that game has been enormously popular. Um, but again, it comes back to customer lifetime value. You know, like maybe it's really popular for a year and then it gets really annoying and no one wants to see it anymore. So, so the future, kind of where we're moving um, as far as social media goes and what our strategy is, 
Um, we're thinking about lots of apps and widgets, so I kind of talked about a few earlier. Um, ways to bring the shopping experience to the social networks and ways to kind of entice our users to leave the social network and come to the shopping experience. Uh, bringing elements of a social network to ModCloth itself. So we're going to be rolling out um, user profiles in the next year. So that's going to be allowing our customer to, when she leaves a review or when she interacts via Be the Buyer or Be the Writer, um, she can actually have a profile and see other like-minded people. And you know, we're still kind of thinking about how much information will be there. But more so than just you know, having an account that you shop with, you'll have a public facing account so you can show people your wish list, so show them the products that you love, the desires that you love, the products that you voted on for be the buyer, that sort of thing. And I'd say a big kind of overarching, strat overarching theme to our social media strategy is really allowing our customers, giving them the tools to become advocates. So better ways to share products, better ways to promote um, like as their entries in our different contests and really like what we see happening on Facebook where customer, a customer asks a question and another customer answers it. We want to make that as easy as possible kind of throughout the shopping experience. So yeah, if you have, like we talked about sizing earlier, if you have a question about sizing, ModCloth can connect you to a customer who actually owns the product who's similar to you, who can give you a great answer. Um, so that's really, you know, kind of how we're envisioning it. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, this is our mascot. It's Winston. It's my dog, and um, that's our little Winston logo. He's at the bottom of every page. And yeah, I'd love to answer any questions, or if there's anything that you'd like me to talk more about, um, I'd be glad to. I kind of want to know what more about your relationship with Etsy sellers. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so right now we're not dealing with very many. I mean, we'll find people, a lot of times it's accessories, so we'll find people or either we'll find them or they'll proactively reach out to us and send us, you know, their line sheet or say, check out my store. And we'll work with them to do, you know, a smaller bulk order. So like 12 of an item or 24, whatever they can handle. Um, and we really look at that as, you know, we want to support their business because, you know, we're small business owners ourselves. And, um, you know, I think it's really important. And we also, you know, it's good for, it's good for us because we're finding, we're showcasing these designs that you can't find anywhere else. You know, you can find it directly from them on Etsy, but as far as retailers go, we're the only ones that carry it. Um, so we see, you know, in the future as with Be The Buyer as we work and learn more about the supply chain and kind of go deeper, become more vertically integrated, um, we can partner with them to put their designs through Be The Buyer to see if there is market potential. Like, could they sell 6,000 if they were able to make them? And then we'll work with them to contract out the actual making to define the materials and to, yeah, that's the vision of it. Um, we have done some, so we've been, we generally stay in the U.S. We do magic, um, we do, pro or, yeah, we do project, we do pool, uh, we do fame, which is here in New York right now. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Oh, we do WSA, which is a big shoe show that's in Vegas twice a year. And then we've done um, bread and butter is basically like the magic of Europe. Um, but it's more, I'd say it's more of streetwear. Um, but we have found some great vendors there. Um, we're actually, we carry some, we, we carry some designers that were the only U.S. store to carry them. Um, and that's, you know, it's really important. We want to have a great product selection and stuff you can't find anywhere else. And we have done um, Who's Next in Paris as well. And hopefully this year we're going to appear in London. I'm really excited because British fashion is pretty awesome. <laughs> Or is there, are there other ways that we can also do 
So I think it's, I mean, it's a big piece and every year it gets bigger and bigger. I mean, when we started in 2002, Facebook didn't exist. Um, you know, Twitter was a long way off. Um, so when we started, we did a lot of Google AdWords and that's still, you know, we still get a lot of traffic from that and it's still pretty important. I would say that, I would say that the social networks are more about building your brand and having a conversation with your customers more so than marketing your product. Um, I think that there, it's, it's a really important piece, but there are other ways. So yeah, via search engines, um, via SEO. So optimizing your site to be found in the natural search listings, um, through blog ads, we do a lot of advertising with bloggers, um, people like celebrity gossip blogs, like Prez Hilton or Delisted, um, we advertise on like cute blogs, so like Cute Overload or I Can't Has Cheeseburger, if you've seen that, it's like lol cats. Um, yeah, I mean, you can kind of, a lot of it is thinking about, you know, where's your customer going to be and what can I put in front of them? And have you ever done any um, print ads? We've done one. Um, we've done a few times, but we've worked with Bust Magazine um, because they approached us and they were kind of like, we like you a lot. And I was, it's actually, it was like one of my favorite magazines when I was in high school. And it was, uh, they were one of the first magazines to feature one of our products in an editorial spread. So we do um, a full page ad with them. I think we've done it for the last like four issues. Um, but print is really, I mean, when you're online only, you can track the ROI from every single click. It's really hard to spend um you know a big lump sum for a print ad that you really can't track at all i mean so there's definitely there's like the brand equity piece so you just want to like get your brand name in front of a lot of eyeballs but for mod cloth our customer is so specific and she's online so much that it really we don't care about just having a full page ad in vogue you know what it just wouldn't be worth the return for us and because we have been you know we're a growing business we're capital constrained there's so many ways to spend the money that we can really see the results immediately that it doesn't make sense for us to do print. Yeah. So we've done, we do everything on the form. Um, we do, so when we do our kind of like marketing shoots for the home pages and for the ads, which we do, and we put up a new set every three weeks and we do like a lookbook and you know, that whole thing. Um, so some of the products do get shot on the model. Um, it's definitely something that we'd love to do more of, um, but just for cost and kind of time, it's easier for us to like keep a better price point without small models are expensive, it takes more time. Um, we definitely, we see a, an opportunity to allow um, customers uploading, allow customers to upload photos as part of the review process and then have voting on those photos so we can kind of you know, from a brand point of view, go in and vote for the best one to show up and allow our customers to do that as well. Um, so we see really like engaging our customers to kind of fill that piece because we're definitely missing it. I mean, seeing a dress on a body is, it's really powerful. So let's say, um, I have a, a little bit of what we talked about earlier. So um, SEO, so structuring the site in a way that it comes up in the organic search results of the search engines. Um, SEM, search engine marketing. Um, we do like these kind of blog ads with independent bloggers and also with bigger bloggers um, across the internet. Let's say, um, well, the Google ad network is actually, there's, um, there's a huge content network. So basically a lot of the banner ads that you see served on blogs and other web pages are served via Google. Um, so you'll see mod cloth pages served by Google or mod cloth ads served by Google on other web pages, but it's mostly like news sources and fashion blogs and that type of thing. Yes. <laughs> Let me see if I have a slide for this. I think I do. Fantastic. Ooh, nope, wrong one. Oh, shoot. 
You guys, I'm really bad with PCs now that I'm on a Mac. Okay, maybe I don't. I'll just talk about it. Um, okay, I'll just talk about it. Where do we see the future? So we definitely, um, you know, we see that we've grown a lot, but we see that we have, from looking at Facebook and looking at demographics, we see that we have a lot of customers still to reach. Um, so we definitely, you know, we see expanding the mod cloth brand with our current demographic and psychographic. Um, but we also think that we're kind of pioneering a way to sell lifestyle goods online. Um, like I mentioned earlier, like commodity goods is taken care of. Like Amazon, you can buy anything. You can buy laundry detergent. You can buy, you know, they, they are starting to move into clothing, but I don't think they really do it well. Um, but we see community-driven lifestyle retail that can exist in a lot of different verticals. So I think, you know, if, mod, if the mod cloth brand reaches saturation, um, you know, we maybe launch like a older brand or it's... And, older so we we think about the demographic and you know we launch a different a different segment a, a new branded experience but we think um you know the the tools that we're building to allow the customers of the brand to really have a say will allow us to yeah to build that and really make yeah a very genuine brand in a lot of different segments that maybe i don't understand or i'm not a part of because yeah a big part of who we are is that I am our customer. So it's like, what happens when I'm not, or what happens if we want to sell to others? Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll find there will be like the Susans of other brands that will come out of the community. Yeah. <laughs> so when we were selling one of a kind vintage, we did have a men's section. And the first season when I went out into the market to kind of find the independently designed, um, vintage inspired goods we did men's as well and i realized pretty quickly that i wasn't a men's buyer it wasn't really what i felt a passion for and it's just not the variety just isn't there in the marketplace um i think there's definitely a need but it's it's kind of like i i'd say it's kind of further out on some other business ideas so we have like fist pounding real demand for extended sizing. So whether that's plus size or petite sizing, and that would make much more sense before we went into men's. But I mean, I definitely, I think there's a need in the market, but as I previously said, but it's, it's different. I mean, my husband owns eight pairs of shoes and I have 200, so <laughs> there's something about, there's something to that. I've heard that some store, I've heard from certain retailers that are, um, co-ed that they just have the men's section to keep the boyfriends in the store while the girlfriends shop. I don't know how true that is, but I've heard that, so. <laughs> yeah. It definitely, it wouldn't be something that I'd be like the head creative for, though. I just don't care about it as much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, we're also um, opening offices in San Francisco and LA, as I mentioned earlier, and we are hiring. So I don't know if any of you guys are approaching graduation, but if you're interested, you know, we're always looking for people that love fashion and want to live in Pittsburgh, San Francisco, or LA. So let me know. I'm Susan at modclot.com. <laughs>